thinking differently. Maron slowed to joke as we approached the gate for our flight to Paris. The plane was still there, but the door to the jetway was shut. The gate agent was quietly sorting tickets. They had already retracted the hood connecting the jetway to the airplane door. Hi, we are on this flight, I panted. Sorry, said the agent, we are done boarding. But our connecting flight landed just 10 minutes ago. They promised us they would call ahead to the gate. Sorry, we can't board anyone after they've closed the door. My boyfriend and I walked to the window in disbelief. Our long weekend was about to fall to pieces. The plane waited right before our eyes. The sun had set and the parlor's downtown faces were bathed in the glow of our, their instrument panel. The whine of the engines intensified and a guy with lighted batons Third turned onto the tarmac. I thought for a few seconds, then I led my boyfriend to the center of the window, right in front of the cockpit. We stood there in plain sight, my entire being focused on the pilot hoping to catch his eye. One of the pilots looked up. He saw us standing for Lonnie in the window. I looked him in the eye, plaintively and pleading. I let my bed slump by my feet, we stood there for what seemed an eternity. Finally, the pilot's lips moved, and the other pilot who looked up. I caught his eye as well, and he nodded. The engine whined so softened and we heard the gate agent's phone ring. She turned to us, wild-eyed. Grab your stuff, she said. The pilot said to let you off. Our vacation is told. We clutched each other joyously, snatched our bags, waved to the pilot and tumbled down the jetway to our plane. The story above told me by a student in my negotiation course was clearly an account of a negotiation completely non-verbal to be sure, but it was done in a conscious, structured, and highly effective way, and it used six separate negotiation tools that I teach that are in practice invisible to almost everyone. 
What are they? First, be dispassionate. Emotion destroys negotiations. You must force yourself to be calm. Second, prepare even for five seconds. Collect your thoughts. Third, find the decision maker. Here it was the pilot. There was not a second to waste on the gate agent, who was not about to change company policy. Fourth, focus on your goals, not on who is right. It didn't matter if the connecting airline was late. Or are wrong in not calling ahead to the gate. The goal was to get on the plane to Paris. Fifth, make human contact. People are almost everything in a negotiation. And finally, acknowledge the other party's position and how valuing them. If you do, they often use their authority to help you achieve your goals. These tools are often very subtle, but they are not magic. They helped this young couple in a way they will remember for a lifetime. And they have to bring about successful negotiation day in and day out. For those who have learned these tools from my courses, from getting a job to getting a raise, from dealing with kids to dealing with colleagues, the kind of negotiation practiced here has given upwards of 30,000 people more power and control over their lives. My goal with this book is to recreate my course on the page, making it available to readers everywhere. It offers a set of strategies, models, and tools that Together, we change the way you view and conduct virtually every human interaction. <clears throat> These teachings are very different from what you have read or studied about negotiation. Based on psychology, they don't depend on win-win or win-lose. They don't depend on being a hard or soft bargainer. They don't depend on rational world, on who has the most power or on praises that makes much of negotiation seem accessible and impractical. Instead, they are based on how people perceive, think, feel, and live in the real world. And they will help anyone do what this book suggests, get more. And that's one of those instinctive human desires isn't it? More. Whenever you do almost anything, don't you wonder if there's more? It doesn't have to mean more for me and less for you. It just has to be well more. And it doesn't necessarily mean more money. It means 
more of whatever you value, more money, more time, more food, more love, more travel, more responsibility, more basketball, more TV, more music. This book is about more, how you define it, how you get it, how you keep it. Whoever you are, wherever you are, the ideas and tools in this book were meant for you. The world is full of negotiation books telling you how to get to yes, get past no, win, gain an advantage, close the deal, get leverage, influence or persuade others, be nice, be tough, and so forth. But of those who finish reading them, few can go out and do it. Besides, sometimes you may want to get to know or you want to get to maybe, or you just want to delay things, but instinctively, you always want to get more of what you want. In getting more, I present this information in such a way that you will actually be able to use it immediately whether ordering a pizza or negotiating a billion dollar deal or asking for a discount on a blouse or a pair of pants. This is what people who take my course are required to do. I tell them to use the strategies the same day, write them down in their journals, practice them, and use them again. Why is this so important? Negotiation is at the heart of human interaction. Every time people interact, there is a negotiation going on, verbally or non-verbally, consciously or unconsciously, driving talking to your kids, doing errands. You can't get away from it. You can only do it well or badly. That doesn't mean you have to actively negotiate everything in your life all the time. But it does mean that those who are more conscious of the interactions around them get more of what they want in life. There is an old maxim about the difference between export and non-export knowledge. A non-export looks at a field and sees flat land. An export looks at the same field see the small peaks and valleys. It takes no more time and energy for the export to collect the greater amount of information from the landscape, but the export can make much better use of that information to pursue opportunities or minimize risks. What we are talking about in getting more is learning better negotiation tools so that you become executively more conscious of the topography of your dealings with others. Like Ray and Chan at the opening of the book, most of those who have taken my course are ordinary people. But they have learned to achieve extraordinary results 
by negotiating with greater confidence and skill. More than one woman from India in my class, using tools from the course, persuaded her parents to let her out of her own arranged marriage. My advice on the negotiation process helped to end the 2008 Writer's Guide Strike. It is the same kind of advice taught in my class and outlined in Chapter 2. A business student who hadn't made it at the first round interview with 18 firms took the course, applied my negotiation tools, and got 12 consecutive final round interviews and the job of his choice. Parents get their younger get their young children to brush their teeth without complaint. We added up the money made and saved by students using these tools. Seven dollars here, one hundred thirty-two dollars there, one million dollars or more in some cases. The total exceeded three billion dollars for about a third of the stories we have collected. And that doesn't count the marriage said, the job obtained, the deals concluded, the parents who were persuaded to go to the doctor, and the kids who did just what they were asked. Most of the more than 400 anecdotes in this book use the actual names of the people involved. They will tell you how they got a raise, achieved the satisfaction after buying defective merchandise, got out of a speeding ticket, got their kids to do their homework, closed a deal, how in a million ways their lives became better, how they got more. For me and the tens of thousands of people have taught, unless these tools work in real life, we are not interested. Who are these people? They come from all walks of life and myriad cultures. Senior executives of billion dollar companies, housewives, students in school, such people, administrative assistants, Executives, managers, lawyers, engineers, stockbrokers, truckers, union workers, artists, you name it. And they come from around the world. The United States, Japan, China, Russia, Colombia, Bolivia, South Africa, Kuwait. Jordan, Israel, Germany, France, England, Brazil, India, Vietnam, and so forth. These tools work for all of them, and they work for you too. Like Ben Friedman, who almost always asks the companies Good services he uses. If your customers are treated better than existing, loyal customers like himself, for example, with discounts or other promotions. 
by asking that question one day, Ben got 33% of his existing New York Times subscription. Wa Suchin Kim, who looks for connection everywhere, one day she saved $200 a year for her daughter's after school French program. Huh? Before asking for a discount, she made a human connection with the school's manager, talking about her trips to France. These strategies will save you a little here, a little there, but it can add up to many thousands of dollars a year. Some make millions at the start. Paul Dorman, a management consultant in New York, reduced a large class expenses by 35%, an incredible 20 points, more than he had been able to do before the course. He knew the standards, persistence, their question, relationship, and being incremental as learned in the course. The first year savings was $34 million. By now, it's over $300 million. He said, I have a major advantage in the marketplace, he said. Richard Morina, then the chief finance officer of the Asbury Park Press, got $245 million more for the company in each sale and $1 million more for himself by using standards, framing, and other horse tools. I will keep practicing, he said, to benefit from the strategies in the book. As Richard did, you have to think differently about how you deal with others. How this book is different? Below are the travel major strategies that together make getting more very different from what most people think negotiation is all about. These strategies will be expanded throughout the book, including the tools that support them and the perspectives that go with them. The strategies will be followed by chapters on how they are used in specific familiar applications such as parenting, travel, and jobs. The strategies together amount to a different way of thinking about negotiation. It's the difference between saying, I play football and I play professional football, the two are barely even the same game. <clears throat> Goals are paramount. Goals are what you want at the end of the negotiation that you don't have at the beginning. Clearly, you should negotiate to meet your goals. May, if not most, people take actions contrary to their goals because they are focused on something else. They get mad in a store or a relationship. They attack the wrong people. In a negotiation, you should not pursue relationship interests within or anything else. Just because 
do you think is an effective tool? Everything you do in a negotiation should explicitly bring you close to your goals for that particular negotiation. Otherwise, it is irrelevant or damaging to you. It's about them. You can't persuade people of anything unless you know the pictures in their heads, their perceptions, sensibilities, needs, how they make commitment, whether they are trustworthy. Find out what third parties they respect, who can help you. How do they form relationship without this information? You won't even know where to start. Think of yourself as the least important person in the negotiation. You must do role reversal, putting yourself in their shoes and trying to put them in your shoes. Using power or leverage can ultimately destroy relationship and cause retaliation. To be ultimately more effective and persuasive, you have to get people to want to do things. Make emotional payment. The world is irrational. And the more important a negotiation is to an individual, the more irrational he or she often becomes. Whether in world peace or a billion dollar deal, or when your child wants an ice cream cone, when people are irrational, they are emotional. When they are emotional, they can't listen. When they can't listen, they can't be persuaded. So, your words are useless, especially those arguments intended for rational or reasonable people like win-win. You need to tap into the other person's emotional psyche with empathy, apologies if necessary. By valuing them while offering them other things that get them to think more clearly. Every situation is different in a negotiation. There is no one size fits all. Even having the same people on different days in the same negotiation can be a different situation. You must analyze every situation on each own. Averages, trends, statics, or past problems don't matter much if you want to get more today and tomorrow. With the people in front of you, blanket rules on how to negotiate with the Japanese or Muslim, what they state you should never make the first offer are simply wrong. There are too many differences among people and situation to be so rigid in your thinking. The right answer to the statement I hate you is tell me more. You learn what they are thinking or feeling so 
that you can better persuade them. Five. Incremental. Incremental is best. People often fail because they ask for too much or at once. They take steps that are too big. This scary people makes the negotiation seem riskier and magnifies differences. Take small steps, whether you are trying for ages or treaties. Read people from the pictures in their heads to your goals, from the familiar to the unfamiliar, a step at a time. If there is a little trust, it's even more important to be incremental. Test each step. If there are big differences between parties, move slowly toward each other, narrowing the gap incrementally. Trade things you value on equally. All people value things on weekly. First, find out what each party cares and does care about, big and small, tangible and intangible, in the deal or outside the deal, rational or emotional. Then trade off items that one party values but the other party doesn't. Try holiday work for more vacation. TV time for more homework. A low price for more reference. This strategy is much broader than interest or needs. In that it uses all the experiences and snapses of people's lives and it greatly expands the pie, creating more opportunities at home and when at the office. It is rarely done the way it should be. Find their standards. What are their policies? Exception to policies. Precedent. Past statements, which they make decisions. Use these to get more. Name their bad behavior when they are not constant with their policies. Did they ever allow late hotel checkout? Will they agree? that no one should interrupt anyone else? Should innocent people be harmed? Isn't high customer service part of their promise? This is especially effective in dealing with hard bargainers. Be transparent and constructive, not manipulative. This is one of the biggest differences between getting war or and the conventional wisdom. Don't deceive people. They find out and the long-term payoff is poor. Be yourself. Stop trying to be tougher, nicer, or something you are not. People can detect fakers. 
being real is high credible, and credibility is your biggest asset. If you are in a bad mood or too aggressive or don't know something, say so. It will help take the issue away. Your approach and your attitude are critical. This does not mean being a pasty or disclosing everything up front. It does mean being honest, being real. Always communicate. State the obvious. Frame the vision. Most fair negotiations are caused by bad communication or non-error. Don't walk away from a negotiation unless all parties agree to take a break or unless you want end the negotiation. Not communicating means not getting information, threatening or blaming the other party just result in their responding in kind. Failing them gets more. The best negotiator state the obvious they will say we don't seem to be getting along. Package what's going on with a few words to give them a vision of where you want them to go. Is it your goal to make your customers happy? Fine. The real problem and make it an opportunity. Few people find what fix the real underlying problem in negotiations, ask what is really preventing me from meeting my goals to find the real problems, you have to find out why the other party is acting the way they are. It may not be obvious at first. You have to prove until you find it. You have to get into their shoes. A dispute of a charge curfew or a business variation may really be a problem of trust and opportunity for a better relationship. And problems are only the start of the analysis. They usually can be taught into negotiation opportunities, view problems as such. 11. Embrace differences. Most people think different is worse, risky, annoying, uncomfortable. But different is actually demonstrably better, more profitable, more creative. It leads to more perception, more ideas, more options, better negotiation, better research. Asking a few more questions about differences will produce more trust and better agreements. Companies Countries and civilization have shown repeatedly by their actions how they hate differences despite their public relations statements. Great negotiators love differences. Prepare. Make a list and practice with it. 
these strategies are the start of a list, which is the entire collection of negotiation strategies, tools, and models. The list is like a pantry from which you choose items for every meal. From the list, you would choose specific items to help you in an individual negotiation based on the specific situation. What is a tool? That is, a specific action to implement a strategy. Apologies and concessions are tools to help you implement the emotional payment strategies. Strategies and tools in this book are organized into a getting more model for easy reference. The list is on my website. You should make your own list. If you don't have a list, you aren't prepared. If you are prepared, you won't do as well. Even spending a few minutes with a list produces better results. Keep pursuing the list. Be persistent until you meet your goals. That means you need practice with these strategies and tools and review them after each negotiation. <clears throat> the effectiveness of these models and strategies and of the individual tools that support them have been confirmed by the 30,000 students and professionals from dozens of countries I have taught. Their experiences are documented in more than 100,000 journals, emails, and notes they have written, as well as in countless interviews and conversations of more than 20 years. <clears throat> All of that is backed by further research and consultations and my own practical experience of 40 years as a teacher, researcher, journalist, lawyer, business executive, and negotiation practitioner. Most of what this book discusses will seem counterintuitive, but it works in the real world immediately. In getting more, you will see exactly how. Invisibility. Two things are evident about these strategies and many of the tools presented here. First, they are not rocket science. Second, unless you already know what they are, they are invisible varied in ordinary language. I started to realize, said Eric Stark, an MBA student at the University of Southern California, that the people I was negotiating with had no idea what I was doing. They had no idea now of telecommunications and internet export. 
He says that this is still true 15 years after the class. My most common opening in the inner negotiation is what's going on. Seems like an ordinary question. But there are at least four tools folded into that question. First, you have to establish a relationship with the other person. You start out informal and chatty. Second, it is your question. Questions are a great way to collect information. Third, it focuses first on the other party and their feelings and perception instead of on the deal. Fourth, it consists of a small talk to establish a comfort level between us. Unless you explicitly know what the tools are, you can uh, replicate them effectively from situation to situation. You just keep going on instinct. And you can get much better at negotiating that way. A few years ago, I was negotiating with someone on a very snowy day. I started the negotiation by saying with some frustration, how about this snow? To which the other person replied, Actually, I love the snow, I love the ski. So then I said, Well, how do you feel about the heat? Why did I say that? Unless you can identify the exact negotiation tool used. You can do much better because you can consciously replicate it in future negotiations. I was trying to find a common enemy. Common enemies bring parties closer together and make the negotiation easier. That's why people complain about the weather. It establishes a human connection and a shared Vantage point. People complain half jokingly about attorneys or traffic or bureaucracy for exactly that reason. Most people are unaware of the common enemies tool. It is invisible to you. You can make it visible unless someone tells you about it. Mutual needs are also good, along with less psychological impact. If you can find them at the start of negotiations, these strategies and tools are also invisible because they are relatively new, at least in how they are used, the modern field of negotiation created by lawyers around 1980 focused on resolving conflicts. This was good, but incomplete. It protected the downside of negotiation, but it didn't focus on much on the upside. Economists got more involved in the negotiation field in the 
1990s and developed one strategies to make money and gain opportunities but this was also incomplete because it relied on people being rational getting more account for these factors of course but it also focuses on the psychology of the people involved this is what most people negotiation should be about the pictures in people's heads you can discover the opportunity or the resolution of conflict unless you think hard about the psychology of the other person but this book is not getting more is not a manifesto to gain power of people in not to force your will on that power or leverage is greatly overrated as a negotiation device most negotiation teachings as well as portrayers of negotiation in movies and TVs urges people to gain advantage over the other party so you can force them to do what you want this has many problems first the moment you use raw power over someone the relationship is usually over people don't want relationship with those who try to force them to do things against their will second it sends the wrong message one of tension struggle and conflict this is less profitable because people use their energy to defend themselves instead of building something third the raw use of power prompts retribution whether now or later whether molecules obedience at work or suicide farmer worldwide Fourth, use power of a reluctant subject is expensive, as will be seen below. Finally, if it's overused, you will often lose your power when others see it expressed. Power must be used gingerly, tactfully, with the approval of others in the military or coach, for example, and for fairness. One should know about the power balance in order to understand how to promote fairness in a negotiation and meet your goals and these strategies give you power it's the application how you use them that matters inherently they are morally neutral they can be used for good or ill like science or kitchen line, knives it is okay to increase your power with hard bargainers who are acting unfairly 
everyone try to hurt you with their power. It is, for example, a great tool for beleaguered consumers to use with unfair companies. It is okay to seek other options if your counterpart is unfairly pressing you, but you always have to be conscious and careful of each abuse. As seen below, use of power or leverage is a form of negotiation. It's usually just not a very good one. It's more expensive and less self-enforcing. If I persuade you to really need to do something, it's usually not very expensive. If I can do that, I might have to turn to an outside party, such as an attorney to negotiate for me. If the attorney can persuade you, then the attorney will turn to another outside, such as a judge or a jury. The attorney then negotiates with the outsider who can then force you to do what you don't want to do. As you can see, there is still negotiation going on, but the more parties and force are added, the more expensive it becomes. As a last resort, it may be needed, but not as an early choice, and certainly not as a knee-jerk one. It is a premise of this book that by using better negotiation skills, you can persuade more people by yourself to do things willingly. The invisible strategies stated above can be a major source of competitive advantage. Nonetheless, you should share them with the other side. This way, they won't feel manipulated and you will get more of the long term. This book is also not about best alternative to a negotiated agreement or other acronyms that seem handy. In reality, they cause people to focus more on working away than on working out something better with the other party. I often say, let's urge assume everyone can walk away and do fine. Given that, can you get more in negotiating with each other? Bargaining range is another item less useful than many people think. You might know the monetary bargain range. <clears throat> The highest the buyer will pay, and the lowest the seller will accept. But you can change the bargaining range by adding other elements to a negotiation, such as by trading items of an equal value. So the more creative you are, the less useful bargaining range, B-A-T-N-A, and its various cousins are. After all is said and done, 
there may be a better alternative to the option you finally develop. And you should explore your options. But first, you should find out what you can do with the people in front of you as creatively as possible. And if you use your options to beat up the other party, it's like going on a date and mentioning who the other party you could go out with. The relationship will probably not get far. I return repeatedly in getting one to the problem with power. It's easy to fall back in the old habit as in, let's make them do it. I want to make sure this doesn't happen.